Good morning, Church at Nine. My name is Terry, and I'll be reading from Old Testament from the Book of Psalms, Chapter Two. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord holds them in derison. Then he will speak to them in his wrath saying, terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is word of our Lord. Hi, my name is Joseph, and I'll be reading from the New Testament uh, from the book of Matthew, chapters 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And, and he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? And when do we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared from the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into internal punishment, but the righteous into internal life. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to, to see you. Um, I must say you're, you're all looking wonderful uh, on my screen at the moment, um, at least the top half of you anyway. Um, hands up if uh, anyone's wearing pyjama bottoms uh, at, at the moment. Yeah, a few honest ones. Um, but uh, it's really good to see you this morning. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, and uh, I see uh, a few uh, people that I don't recognize uh, this morning, then uh, can I say a special welcome to you? Uh, my name is Huey. I'm uh, the Minister of, of Church at Nine, and uh, it's great that you can join us this morning. Uh, during the session this morning, uh, one of our staff members, Sophia, 
uh, we'll get in touch with you uh, via the chat function uh, of Zoom. And it'd be great if you can leave us your, your email address uh, so that we can get in touch with you during the week. And we'd love to get to know you further uh, that way. Uh, well, as um, Ian mentioned, uh, what, a, what a week we've had. Um, who would have thought that we'd be online again like this, uh, seeing each other through a screen? Uh, I'm guessing that many of us are feeling anxious uh, about a whole variety of things. Um, I know that uh, some of us are feeling very disappointed because our holiday plans have been cancelled and um, other plans have, have not come to fruition. Uh, and it's, it's a very frustrating feeling, isn't it? But uh, I, I'm thankful to God that uh, we can still share this time uh, around God's word together this morning. And uh, my hope and prayer for us this morning is that um, as we hear God's word, um, our eyes might be lifted up from our current situation and uh, we might see uh, wonderful heavenly realities and that, that we would leave this morning uh, with every reason to keep on rejoicing and keep on being thankful to God for his kindness to us. And uh, so it'll be great if you can have your Bibles open in front of you. Um, uh, keep it open at Matthew chapter 25, and uh, we'll have a look at that chapter together. But uh, before we, we do that, uh, why don't we pray and uh, ask God for his help uh, to understand his word this morning. Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning after an unsettling week of change. And we pray that you would please have mercy on our city, that the coronavirus outbreak will be brought under control and that lives might not be lost. And Father, we pray for wisdom for our government and for our citizens to display love in doing the right thing at this time. Now, but Father, we uh, thank you especially uh, that your plans for us never change. Now, thank you that Jesus is still our King and Saviour. We thank you that he's still sitting on his throne at your right hand. And we thank you that one day he will come again to fix this broken world of ours. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you might rid our mind of distractions and ease our anxieties. Help us to focus on your word and help us to see Jesus clearly so that our hope might not rest on fleeting things, but in solid heavenly things that will last forever. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, friends, I, I don't know about you, but uh, I would not like to be living in New Zealand at the moment. Uh, you might have heard this week that scientists have just released a study saying that there is a 75% of a magnitude 8 earthquake uh, that is going to hit New Zealand in the next 50 years. Uh, apparently, there has been a huge earthquake in New Zealand every 300 years or so, and uh, the next one is not very far away. And so this report urges people living in these areas uh, to get ready for that terrifying day. Uh, on that day, there will be widespread devastation there will be tsunamis along the coast. Uh, conditions will be unpredictable. And so the advice is that uh, people need to get ready now by stocking up on the right equipment. They need to build appropriate shelters. They need to have emergency plans in place. For you see, when an event of this magnitude happens, the difference between being prepared or not is literally the difference between life and death, isn't it? Uh, now, we've been working our way through Jesus's last major teaching block in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, this has been uh, Jesus's message all along, hasn't it? Uh, the coming of the Son of Man or the great day of judgment is just around the corner. And so it is vitally important that you and I get ready for that day. For the difference between get, getting ready and not being ready is literally the difference between eternal life and eternal punishment in hell. Uh, you can see it at the end of our passage today, can't you? Uh, if you have a look there at verse 46 of Matthew chapter 25, 
uh, Jesus says, uh, and, and these, or some people, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, this is the final sermon that Jesus um, preaches before he heads to his trial and crucifixion and resurrection in chapters 26 to 28 of Matthew's Gospel. And like all final words, uh, the things that Jesus says here are weighty and they need our urgent attention. Now, you can see there that Jesus' topic is the great and final day uh, of judgment in this world. Uh, in verse 31, he speaks there about the Son of Man coming uh, in all his glory with the angels to sit on his glorious throne. Uh, if you've been following along over the past month, you will know that um, I, I, I think that uh, what Jesus is talking about here is his resurrection and exaltation to God's right hand in heaven, where he now sits ruling with all authority and, and power. But then in verse 32, he speaks about the judgment of the world. Uh, the picture he gives here is of all the nations gathered around the judgment throne of the Son of Man, where he will ultimately separate people and determine their eternal destinies. Now, you might be wondering um, why Jesus speaks about his resurrection and exaltation on the one hand, and the day of judgment, on the other hand, as, as one event here. Um, for Christians typically understand the resurrection of Jesus and the day of judgment as two separate events, uh, don't they? Don't we? Uh, but that's because uh, in the Old Testament, the day of resurrection and the day of judgment uh, was understood to be one event rather than two. Uh, you can see it, for example, at the end of uh, the Old Testament book of Daniel, uh, from which uh, Jesus bases so much of his thinking. Uh, Daniel is given a vision at the end of Daniel chapter 12, 1 to 2, and listen to how the, the idea of resurrection and judgment uh, come together as one event here. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 says, but at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, resurrection, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt, judgment. And so you can see in Matthew that Jesus is still speaking in Old Testament terms. But make no mistake, what he is talking about and what he is saying is that the final judgment at the end of the world is just around the corner. Now, friends, uh, if you turn back uh, with me to Matthew chapter 25, uh, I want you to see some very important things that Jesus says about this day of judgment. Uh, firstly, notice that this judgment uh, will be universal in nature. Uh, in verse 32, all the nations of the world and every single person in this world will be gathered before the judgment throne of the king. In other words, uh, you cannot say that judgment is something that is just relevant for Christian people who believe in this sort of stuff, but not relevant for others who simply want to wish it away. No, what the Bible teaches is that Judgment is inescapable. One day, you and I, along with every other person in this world, will bow the knee to Jesus before his judgment throne. Secondly, notice that the judgment will be on Jesus' terms. Uh, in verse 33, it is Jesus who will place his sheep on his right, which is the place of power and honour. And it is Jesus who will place the goats on his left, which is the place of execution. It's not that sheep are inherently better than goats here. It's just that the sheep are the ones who ultimately belong to Jesus, who is the great shepherd, while the goats do not belong to him. 
Now, I reckon that lots of people in this world think that judgment will happen on their terms. Uh, lots of people, for example, think that if and when judgment day comes, uh, God uh, will really only punish the really bad apples in this world, by which uh, most people mean murderers and pedophiles. But God should turn a blind eye to my sin, think many people because I've decided that I'm a decent person. And so God should excuse me of my hatred, for example, and my lies and my greed and my sexual immorality and the way I have treated and harmed other people in my life. But no, can you see here that judgment will be universal and it will not be on our terms, which is often so favourable to ourselves, but it will be on Jesus' terms as the one who sits on the throne. Are you ready for that day? Where you and I, where will you and I be placed on that day when we stand before the judgment throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King? Now, what will happen to the sheep and the goats who are separated on that day? Well, now in the rest of the passage, Jesus goes on to tell us precisely what will happen, uh, beginning with the sheep. And what will happen to the sheep? Well, you can see there that they will hear a gracious invitation by the king to receive the blessing of their heavenly inheritance. Uh, you can see it there in verse 34, can't you? Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come. You who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But on what basis will these sheep inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, at first glance, it seems as if they will inherit the kingdom of heaven based on their works of charity towards others, doesn't it? Their philanthropy towards others. In verse 35, the king says that uh, these are the people who have fed the hungry and have hydrated the thirsty and showed hospitality towards strangers. In verse 36, he says that they are the ones who have clothed the naked and visited the sick and cared for those in prison. Uh, of course, the point that Jesus is making here is that by doing these things for other people, these sheep have actually done these things to him. And that's why Jesus begins by saying, I was hungry and, uh, and, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink and so forth. But later in verse 45, he says to the sheep that what you did for others, these things that you did for others, you actually did it to me. Here's the million dollar question, friends. Is Jesus teaching here a form of salvation by works? In other words, is this a call for his disciples to uh, set up soup kitchens and build hospitals and give to charities if they want to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, friends, I, I think there are some important clues in the text itself that suggests that this isn't actually what Jesus is saying here. Uh, what are these clues? Uh, well, the first clue is that the blessing of heaven for the sheep is described in verse 34 as an inheritance. Uh, do you see that in, in verse 34? Now, uh, this is important because an inheritance is not something you receive on the basis of your works and how much you do, but it's something that you receive on the basis of your status as a member of the family. Uh, you know, in my old age, if I'm lying on my deathbed and uh, Levi comes to me wanting his, his inheritance, uh, I'm not going to ask him at that stage what he got on his report card the, uh, the previous year. Uh, no, I'm going to say to him, uh, you are my son. You are my firstborn son, and I love you. 
And so I'd love you to have my 2016 Volkswagen Golf. Uh, enter into the joy of your father, I will say. But the second clue is the language of predestination. Uh, notice again in verse 34 that the king says that the kingdom of heaven has been prepared for the sheep from the foundation of the world. In other words, it was God's plan all along that these sheep would belong to him and that they would inherit the kingdom of heaven even before they had a chance to do anything good or bad. And so Jesus here is not speaking about salvation by works. You know, so many people think about Christianity uh, in this way, don't they? Uh, many people think about Christianity a little bit like earning frequent flyer points. You know, um, you do enough good things and you give to charity and uh, you do all those sorts of things, and you earn frequent flyer points with God, and one day at the end you will have enough points um, to fly straight into heaven. But no, although every other religion in this world has this kind of works-based thinking, Christianity is radically different. For Christianity is not about earning your way into heaven, by how much you do, but it is about the gracious plan of God to save his people from their sins. But if this passage is not about doing more charity or salvation by works, then what is it all about? Well, friends, I think the key to understanding this passage is understanding who Jesus is talking about when he mentions in verse 39 the brothers whom the sheep have taken care of. Uh, you can see there that Jesus says to the sheep, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Now who are these brothers that the sheep have, have cared for? Well, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' brothers are not his um, blood brothers, members of his physical family, uh, nor is it speaking about every single male person. Uh, you know, these days, uh, blokes indiscriminately call each other brothers, don't they? But here, Jesus is really speaking about those who are his followers. Uh, for example, in chapter 12, verse 50, Jesus says, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so when Jesus mentions brothers, he's speaking about members of his spiritual family. And so, friends, you can therefore see that this is not a call by Jesus for his disciples to engage in more charitable work which I assume is not limited to simply disciples of Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, there is an important place for such charity and good works in the life of a Christian. It's just that that's not what Jesus is talking about here. What then is he speaking about? Well, uh, I think the brothers whom Jesus speaks about here is a little bit narrower than simply all of his uh, followers. For, uh, turn back with me to uh, chapter 10 of Matthew's Gospel. If you have your Bibles there with you, uh, it'll be uh, really important to turn back to uh, Matthew chapter 10. And uh, you can see there in Matthew chapter 10 that 12 brothers in particular were previously sent out by Jesus on mission to uh, the towns of Israel, and namely the 12 apostles. Um, in verse 7 of chapter 10, you can see that they were to go into the towns of Israel proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the king. Interestingly, if you read on, uh, these 12 apostles were not to take any money um, for, for shelter, nor were they to take any food nor were they to take any extra clothing. 
but they were to simply depend on others who would receive them into their homes. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, at the end of chapter 10, what Jesus says is that those who receive the apostles are the ones who receive Jesus himself. In other words, if anyone received the apostles by um, feeding them and clothing them and giving them shelter, well, they were the ones who ultimately received Jesus as their king. Uh, you can see it there in chapter 10, verse 40. These are uh, really important verses. So have a look at uh, chapter 10, verse 40. Uh, Jesus says to his apostles, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones, that is the, the apostles, even a cup of water because he is a disciple, truly I say he will by no means lose his reward. Uh, this week, uh, my wife and I uh, got a knock on the door. Uh, when we opened the door, uh, little two-year-old Addie, uh, who belongs to Mike and Mercy, who live next door, was standing there. Uh, she was holding a present for us. Uh, I think it was a stick of ginger or something that um, Mike and Mercy uh, were sending as a gift uh, to, to Hewan and myself. Uh, now, imagine if we said to Addie, uh, Addie, uh, go away. I don't want that stick of ginger. Uh, it would be a reflection of what we ultimately thought of Mike and Mercy, wouldn't it? And the gift that they were sending. But if we said to Addie, Addie, uh, come on in, darling. Uh, let, let us give you a lolly for your trouble. Uh, thank your mum and dad for us. Well, it reflects something of what we think about Mike and Mercy's generosity to us, doesn't it? You see, receiving the messenger is like receiving the one who sent the messenger, isn't it? Now, uh, if you turn back with me to Matthew chapter 25, uh, that is precisely what is going on here, isn't it? The sheep are the ones who have received Jesus as messengers by taking them into their homes and feeding them and clothing them and giving them a place to stay, ultimately because they receive Jesus as their king. The thing that qualifies them for the kingdom of heaven is not ultimately their charity, but it is their reception of Jesus as their king. And so the application of this passage is not to ask whether you are doing enough charity work in your life. You know, it's very easy to read passages like this, isn't it? And I think, well, I haven't been giving enough to charity recently, and I wonder whether uh, that disqualifies me from, uh, from heaven. Uh, it's very easy to feel guilty and think uh, I need to pull up my moral socks in order to be accepted by God. But no, remember that Jesus is speaking these words primarily to his disciples who have already received Jesus as messengers and have received Jesus as their king. You see, uh, friends, if you are a disciple of Jesus, then there was a day in your past, wasn't there, where Jesus sent a messenger to you to share the message that Jesus is king. It could have been a friend, like my friend Sean, uh, who told me the good news of Jesus in primary school. It could have been a parent. It could have been a work colleague. But whoever it was, on that day, you received this person and you received Jesus as the king of your life. And if that is you, then what Jesus is saying here is that you are somebody who is tremendously blessed as somebody who will inherit the kingdom of heaven itself. Isn't that extraordinary? 
What Jesus says here is meant to be a comfort to his disciples rather than something that robs them of assurance. However, later on in Matthew's gospel, we find that uh, it's not just the 12 apostles who are met the messengers of Jesus, but every disciple in this world is to be a messenger of Jesus who proclaims the good news of the kingdom. And so if there are messengers of Jesus who experience poverty and injury and prison because of their witness for Jesus, then the way we pray for them and the way we care for them and their needs is a reflection of our attitude towards Jesus, isn't it? Uh, in our staff meeting this week, one of our new ministers, who was a missionary in China for many years, said that because of his decision uh, to give up his comfort and to go on mission in China, he and his wife would often be without a car and without a place to stay and without uh, the basic necessities when they came back to Australia on, uh, on home assignment. But he was so thankful because they always were well supplied by other Christian people who provided for their needs. Jesus would say to those Christian people, what you did for this disciple, you did it for me. Or how about the one in eight Christians who are persecuted all around the world because of their witness for Jesus? You know, these brothers and sisters lose their jobs or are thrown into prison or suffer um, other hardships for no other reason other than their confession of Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Do we take an interest in them and provide for them and care for them, uh, perhaps through organisations uh, such as Open Doors? Jesus would say to us today, what you do for them, you do for me. Or perhaps closer to home, there are people in our congregation who have left behind material comforts in order to be better equipped as messengers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to say that uh, all the ministers in our church are, are very well uh, provided for, and uh, we are so thankful to God uh, for the generosity of people like yourselves in, in caring for us. But how about our student ministers? or ministry trainees and others who are making tough decisions to leave behind material comfort in order to become better equipped as messengers? Do you know who they are? Uh, do we take an interest in their lives? Do we provide for them and care for them? Jesus would say, what you do for them, you do for me. Well, friends, uh, if the sheep are the ones who are given the blessing of the kingdom by the king, uh, the goats, on the other hand, are the ones who are ultimately rejected by the king. Notice uh, that what Jesus says to the goats in verse 41 is the direct opposite of what he says to the sheep. Rather than the invitation to, to come, he says to the goats, depart. Rather than giving them blessing, there is nothing but cursing here. Rather than eternal life in the kingdom, the goats here are sent to eternal punishment in hell. Now, clearly, these, mess, uh, these images of hell are metaphorical in some sense. I mean, it's very hard to imagine, isn't it, how hell can be an eternal fire in verse 41 and a place of darkness, which we saw uh, in verse 30 last week. But while these images may be metaphorical, they, are, they, are, um, they do tell us something very real and terrifying about hell. For example, the language of departing tells us that hell 
is about being eternally separated from the king. You know, often non-Christian people uh, joke that, you know, that they don't mind going to hell because at least they can have a barbecue with their friends. Uh, have you ever heard people speaking uh, like that? But if hell is eternal separation from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the source of life and everything good, then why do you expect to have friends in, in hell? Or why do you expect to enjoy a banquet in hell? No, being apart and separated from the king means nothing but death and isolation. Or uh, take the language of eternal fire. Uh, it's an image that suggests um, everlasting anguish, isn't it? And so hell is not about uh, what theologians call annihilation, which means you, you just simply cease to exist after that point. Uh, neither is there any suggestion here that there are second chances when it comes to hell. No, hell is a place which is final and it will be a place of everlasting punishment from God. But on what basis will the goats be sentenced to hell? Well, interestingly, it's not on the basis of what they have done here. Uh, rather, it's on the basis of what they have not done. And what, they, what have they not done? Well, they are the ones who have not received the messengers of Jesus and therefore have not received Jesus himself as their king, as the personal king of their lives. They have not welcomed the strangers and fed them and, uh, sorry, they have not welcomed the messengers and fed them and clothed them and housed them. And this rejection of Jesus as messengers is actually a rejection of Jesus himself. You see, uh, as Mike mentioned in the kid spot, it is entirely fair for those who push Jesus out of their lives and continue to do so will one day Jesus will push them away from him. Uh, friends, if you are here this morning um, and you are um, uh, watching uh, this, this sermon, and uh, you are someone who has not received Jesus as the king of your life, then be warned. If you are still living your life with yourself as the king rather than Jesus as the king, the one who calls the shots in your life, then be warned. For your relationship with Jesus now will determine your eternal destiny when one day you stand before him as the king on the great day of judgment. And so before that terrible day comes, uh, will you turn to Jesus as the king of your life? Will you turn away from a life of ignoring him, uh, rejecting him, uh, not living his way? and enthrone, enthrone him as the king of your life. Uh, for friends, this king is such a gracious and kind king. He is a king who does not desire eternal death for you, but eternal life. And he has demonstrated that, as we shall see in following chapters, by dying on the cross, to face the hell that you and I deserved for our sin and rebellion so that we might enjoy eternal life with him in heaven. One thing is clear from what Jesus says uh, in this chapter. There is no sitting on the fence with Jesus. You either have received him as your king or you have not. You are either a sheep or a goat. And so which will it be? Uh, will you receive Jesus as your king this morning? Let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great kindness to us in our lives. And uh, we want to pause for a moment to remember your kindness 
in sending messengers to us who shared with us the good news of Jesus. And we thank you for giving us the faith to receive Jesus as our King. We thank you indeed um, for Jesus and what he has done for us. Uh, what a wonder that he would die for sinners like us so that our sin would be dealt with at the cross and that forgiveness and eternal life in the kingdom of heaven would be ours. Now, Father, we pray that uh, you would help us to see uh, even more clearly this morning uh, just how gracious and wonderful and loving um, our King really is. And we pray that you would help us to serve him by being proclaimers of his goodness and being messengers. Uh, and in particular, uh, we also ask that you would help us to care for other messengers of Jesus who are suffering for their Christian witness. Now, Father, forgive us for often being concerned only for our welfare and help us to be concerned for the welfare of these brothers and sisters who are suffering all around the world uh, simply for naming uh, Jesus as their Lord. We pray that you would move our hearts to provide for their needs and that through suffering messengers like these, your gospel will be heard in all the world and that many uh, from all the nations might receive Jesus as their King and Saviour. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.